second the day of the entire end conference um I'm glad to see you all back uh, and some new faces also uh, yesterday we uh, had a uh, overview of the platform as it is now and with all the facilities and new features uh, we also had a a discussion and a presentation about how training materials are on the embassy platform and uh, how cases and scenarios are on the platform and what's the importance of these elements of the platform for fostering resource integrity and resource ethics in Europe and beyond. But today we will continue with some uh, major uh, aspects of the, uh, the embassy platform. Uh, first, uh, Chris Dierichs will uh, be the chair of a session on guidelines and guidance. So we have guidelines on the platform and we also hope that the platform will help uh, those who are working with uh, making guidelines or applying guidelines. The, uh, the, the platform will be uh, useful for them and we'll hear about their experiences. Uh, after that, in the first uh, session before the break, we will have the uh, the results of the scenarios competition. Mohammed Hosseini will uh, present the jury report and also the winners of the competition. Uh, then we have a break. And after the break, we will discuss the future of the embassy in a session which is shared by Anna Marusik and in which people uh, from Europe will say how they see uh, the future of, of the embassy. Um, for each session, we have uh, three speakers and uh, then discussion afterwards. Um, if you have any questions for the discussion, you can put them in the Q&A and we will make sure that the chair sees uh, the questions and also uh, hands them over uh, during the discussion time. So there will not be a discussion directly after presentation, but after uh, three presentations at the end of a session. I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, in, a, in the afternoon with new information, new uh, things to be discussed. Uh, and I hope uh, the same is true for you. Uh, I now hand over the floor to our first uh, uh, session chair. And that's Chris Dierix from uh, Leuven University, one of our um, work package leaders in the entire project. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Guy. Welcome also on behalf of this uh, first session. As you know, yesterday we were focusing on training, education and cases. And today, which is also or was also an important part of the entire project, we will focus in this first session on guidelines and guidance. And first of all, we will get an international European perspective on the European Code of Conduct. And as some of you might know, there is a working group that is drafting a new revision of this code. And these activities will be presented by one of the board members of this working group, namely Professor Krista Varantola. She is a Chancellor uh, Emerita from the Tempere University. And as I said, and board member of the revision group that works on a new version of the European Code of Conduct. I'm happy to give the floor to uh, my colleague Farantola. Please uh, open, turn on your mic and your camera. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, yes, sir. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to give you a short report on what's going on in what we internally call the refresh group to show that it's a question of refresh of the European Code of Conduct, the ALEA Code. Uh, uh, I'm a board member of ALEA and I'm chairing this small task group within the permanent group, uh, group on science and ethics, which again is chaired by Maura Heine, who could equally well I've given this this talk by Mora is on on your on the advisory board of of Entai. Uh, what we're doing now at the moment with with the with the code is that um, that we have had this task group has had 
a couple of, of online meetings and, and what we're taking into account, of course, in our refresh. I'll, I'll explain to you what I mean by refresh very soon. Is uh, earlier comments to the current version, uh, stakeholder comments different from the, the, that have, for example, entire was, was present at, at one of, of our uh, online meetings. Then comments from this, the individual members of this task group. And then, of course, there's lots of material that has come into being since um, since the first uh, version of the, or, or since the, the, the original, what should I call it, the, the current version of, of the code that was finished 2017. Uh, a number of finished EU project statement recommendations that actually have not been synthesized, I think. Uh, they would be very good to, to get an idea of what sort of recommendation have come from all these ethics-related projects, I would say. So what we're looking forward to is, is a face-to-face -face meeting because we realized very very quickly that it's impossible to edit a whole document online. You have to have a face-to-face -face meeting. And, and we, we are planning to have one early December in, in Berlin. And our aim there is to, to produce a first full draft version of the, of the, uh, uh, of the, the refresh code, refreshed code, and then and finalize it and stake, uh, send it out to stay for stakeholder comments. So that, that is the current status. What is our mandate then and aim? Uh, Alea board, of course, Alea owns the document, so to say. It's um, and and from the, the board, we got the re very strong recommendation: no unnecessary changes. And talk about a refresh, not revision, not even an update. In other words, don't make it any longer. Uh, keep. The, the current version is the basis for many national codes. So it would have many ripple effects if we tried to do something as, as, as a big revision or something like that. So that's not the aim. Also a strong recommendation that, we, let's say that the sub, our, our task force also agrees and, and the, the, the science and ethics working group that, um, keep the current level of abstraction of gener generality. It's a document on principles. It's a reference document. It's a framework document. And what is important, it is based on self-regulation. It's, it's the Alea point of view. So it's, it's not a legal document. Now, the EU has adopted the document uh, with, uh, as a kind of legal document. So that's something we need to, to discuss with the EU as the so from our layer point of view, it's based on self-regulation, which I'm very happy about because self, I think that self-regulation is actually more binding than for individual researchers and research environment than the legal documents, but we can discuss that later. So what, what the code is essentially, at the moment, and also I think will be in the future, is, is a code of good researcher behavior. On the other hand, there are some pressures from different stakeholders to, to go into greater detail in this code. And there's some also from inside the group, there's some ideas, but um, we have been advised and we think we should resist this temptation. At our recent web meeting, we heard presentations also by representatives of, of, of the entire project and what they brought up in their presentation was that they pointed out, for example, that um, equality, diversity, inclusion, access and representation are not included in the code. And we're not, uh, we don't talk about honest errors in the code. So these are the kind of issues that we will be discussing at our next, next meeting. Then there's some terminological differences. Then there are some concrete suggestions 
from the EU's European Commission uh, for, uh, about modif mo modifying the, the code. And in, in their interest, cu currently, they, uh, they would like us to, to comment on, on, on uh, assessing research terms, uh, research teams, um, assessing research projects and, and note the importance of increasing importance of teamwork. Uh, these uh, we'll discuss, but as I said, that we, the EC is, is, is also currently very keen on research assessment, new uh, rethinking research assessment. And then I would like us to to uh, to say something about the reproducibility of the results of that. But here we, we come into problems because the ALEA code refers to all disciplines. It's not for the 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 uh, not only for the science and technology area, it's also for for social sciences, humanities. So it's an all embracing code in that sense. Of course, these these are types of dis, uh, talk, uh, topics we get to discuss, and then they, we have come across earlier, and I suppose we also come this time the comment of what science, what's research. We try to avoid the use of science because it still has this very natural science orientation, or it's read as referring only 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 to natural sciences of course this problem doesn't exist in in many other languages so, so so but that's why we talk about research in most cases i have some reflections on on what's going on in this this research integrity area at the moment and and i, I will comment now these at this this and so i think that you could ask that if is there a paradigm shift in the air? Is is the end of this quantitative competition area, the counting frenzy, so to say, coming to an end? Because there, there are many changes in the air. The recess integrity seems now to be used interchangeably with recess climate, recess culture, recess system. And that's why all these demands to expand the code. But, uh, and the current code focuses on the individual researchers and will probably do so also in the future, but we probably need to emphasize the role of all actors in the research system and uh, that they need, they might need their own codes and on, on what is proper behavior. And by this, I refer to, to, to uh, institutions, funders, um, uh, uh, publishers, uh, e even political decision makers, because they, in the end, uh, are behind the national uh, funding formula uh, and, and and what they emphasize there. So I think there's there's a lot going on at the moment. So I think we should have the emphasis on in all our codes on what makes it possible for individual researchers to follow the ethical standards. And this emphasis we haven't had earlier. There are uh, Alea has commented on 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 the need to review the whole research system in in for example in its comments to to plan s says that the the to to implement the open access platform or open access idea will require a fundamental reevaluation of of the responsibilities of all the different actors a particular attention must be paid to the impact of, of on early stage researchers, those from disadvantaged institutions, communities, and those working in specialist disciplines. And then, then a re very recent comment is, is, is uh, refers to equity and open access. This, the, there will be an, in very soon an international open access week. And, and, and one of the comments from Malia is that it matters how we open knowledge 
building structural e equity, in other words, open access, open access becomes a hollow promise if at the same time as the library door is open, inequitable structures within academic research uh, get reinforced. And this, of course, is, is first to all, all, all the ways universities have to pay or individual researchers, research uh, projects have to pay to get their, their results published. So we need to do a lot with publisher ethics as well, but that's a, probably the hardest not to crack. And then, of course, there the, uh, there's a lot going on within open data, but but this is probably does probably not belong to the context of the European Code, General Code. So my my hope is actually that um, when RI is being used as an umbrella concept, as referring to the whole research, that that the ethos of science is on its way back. So the the focus is shifting to to real issues. And um, I would end, end, end by saying that, but let's remember that most research, researchers start with a very honest mindset. They, that, that, why would they concentrate on, on fraud, in other words? So, but we need a healthy research environment that makes it possible for researchers to pursue their these inherent values within the within the system, and we need different codes to be in place to 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 implement this. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Varantola, for sharing your experience and insights with us. As the audience knows, we have no time for questions at this moment. But if you have a concrete question or a comment or a suggestion regarding the lecture of Dr. Parantola, please post it in questions and answers, and we will pick it up later at the end of this session for discussion. So thank you very much. After this uh, European perspective on the code of conduct, we look now to an other kind of guidance, not a code, but SOPs. And Therefore, we have invited uh, Professor Niels Meilgaard from the Aarhus University, and he's also coordinator of European projects on SOPS for RAI, and I'm sure he will introduce us into this concept. Professor, you have the floor. Please share your, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and thank you to the entire consortium for um, for this uh, invita uh, invitation. I will be speaking from um, the perspective of uh, the standard operating procedures for research integrity uh, project that you just uh, so kindly uh, mentioned. And I'll try to uh, say a few words about how we see our efforts uh, linking with the embassy of uh, uh, good science. Um, the project uh, is, uh, like entire, uh, funded uh, ambitiously by the European uh, Commission. It runs for yet another uh, year. It includes 13 partners across 10 countries, um, 30 plus, maybe even 40 individuals, too many to uh, name here, <clears throat> but several are actually among uh, the speakers and audience uh, today including uh, the chair of the session and the chair of uh, uh, the uh, entire end conference. Um, we start in our project from a recognition uh, that uh, misconduct and question research practices are non-trivial and that exactly as uh, Chancellor uh, Van Tola said, organizations need to step up uh, their game because they play a crucial role in enabling researchers uh, to uh, work in accordance with uh, fundamental principles of research uh, integrity and in promoting a strong research integrity culture. Our aim uh, in the project is to develop a toolbox containing specific standard operating procedures, uh, guidelines, inspirational cases, and other sorts of resources that organizations specifically 
can apply when they tailor their plans to promote research integrity. So in many ways, what we hope to offer is um, well aligned with the ambitions and aspirations of the embassy of uh, good science, but focusing specifically on two kinds of uh, organizations, those that fund and those that perform uh, research. We work through a fairly extensive uh, empirical uh, program, uh, co-create with end users our results and knowledge products. We try to be sensitive towards organizational as well as national uh, differences. Uh, and I wanted to stress that we have uh, um, continuously from the beginning onwards, collaborate with the Embassy of Good Science as a way of uh, increasing, boosting our own dissemination efforts, but also as a way of contributing to uh, creating this uh, uh, vital European hub for knowledge about research uh, uh, integrity, which was produced by the entire uh, project. Uh, as you can see, we work iteratively in uh, different cycles of research. I will not go into uh, details in these uh, 10 minutes. Our main argument is that uh, there is a need to bridge between uh, the fundamental principles of research integrity on the one hand and the factory floor, the factory floor so to speak, um, the responsible conduct of uh, research on the other hand. And we believe that a uh, um, comprehensive research integrity promotion plan at the organizational level that includes specific policies and procedures and make, uh, makes use of uh, a set of uh, targeted uh, uh, standard operating procedures as well as uh, guidelines and other tools is a way of uh, uh, ensuring that uh, uh, this bridge is actually uh, created and uh, maintained. Uh, so our primary argument is that organizations need to develop, uh, implement, uh, monitor and maintain a research integrity promotion plan. Uh, we've also pointed, uh, and this is one of uh, the firm conclusions of our empirical uh, work, to a number of core topics, including uh, some of those that uh, Chancellor uh, Varantola uh, mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, that should be addressed in a research integrity uh, promotion plan. Again, I will not go into uh, details, but we have fleshed these uh, out. Uh, in a document which is actually called a guideline for promoting research integrity at research performing organizations. And similarly, we point to six topics that research funding organizations should uh, target in their um, plans to promote research uh, integrity. And we have uh, created a, a, a similar document, uh, a, two, a brief two pager uh, to enable them to get uh, started. These uh, documents have actually been picked up by the European uh, Commission, uh, which is now uh, requiring organizations uh, as part of the standard template for um, uh, <clears throat> uh, the standard template for proposals for Horizon uh, Europe to have in place appropriate policies and procedures uh, to foster research uh, uh, integrity. Now, uh, in terms of uh, tools, that is the uh, uh, um, the vehicles for ensuring the uh, appropriate implementation of the research integrity promotion plan. We have uh, engaged in a very interesting uh, work, and uh, this is uh, 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 partly led by uh, uh, Chris uh, himself and his uh, uh, team in Leuven, but also the Amsterdam team, which are present uh, today, of trying to create a set of uh, um, precise supplementary guidelines that may uh, uh, that may come in handy in areas that are not well covered by existing resources. So our work started with an inventory, uh, a review of existing resources, including th those uh, made available through the Embassy of uh, the Good Science, but in areas where uh, topics are not uh, um, well-informed in terms of uh, uh, specific plans and procedures, 
we have started creating with uh, organizations themselves, with policymakers and end users of our toolbox, novel uh, guidelines and standard operating procedures will, which will be made available uh, at our uh, web platform. Um, on the left-hand side are the areas where we are now uh, co-creating novel guidelines. And on the right-hand side of this uh, screen is uh, a couple of examples of uh, the resources, the tools, the guidelines, and SOPs that are now already embedded in our virtual uh, toolbox uh, environment. Um, in terms of the next steps uh, of the project, we are now working with a number of organizations to actually try to uh, test um, and uh, to pilot test and evaluate, assess the relevance and uh, appropriateness of the tools that we are offering in our toolbox. Uh, these include uh, organizations that committed early on, marked in blue on the right-hand side, but also a number of uh, organizations uh, who have been volunteering over the last couple of uh, months to take part in our pilot uh, uh, program. The um, Im importance of our pilot phase, which is ongoing now led by Nicole Füger in uh, uh, Austria, is to uh, ins ensure that we... Um, uh, that the tool, that the range of tools we offer are in fact fitted to and tailored to the needs of uh, organizations. Uh, we also uh, experiment with different uh, ways of uh, implement, uh, implementing research integrity promotion plan, uh, exploring uh, the necessity and the uh, helpfulness of uh, including a broad range of, uh, of uh, stakeholders within organizations in order to create uh, legitimacy. Uh, to make sure that uh, we build on existing policies and procedures already developed and existing within uh, organizations, that we take very seriously the costs, uh, administrative, uh, uh, financial, and other types of uh, cost when implementing uh, novel procedures and, uh, um, uh, um, and, and uh, policies, uh, and uh, to avoid excess uh, bureaucracy to avoid undermining the intrinsic motivation of uh, researchers who on the whole want to do uh, good uh, and high quality uh, research. So at this point in uh, time, we are trying to test the quality, so to speak, of the standard operating procedures and guidelines that we offer. In terms of interaction with the embassy of uh, uh, good science, uh, I think that we uh, will be producing something which is uh, uh, complementary. Uh, already at this uh, point, the embassy has a very impressive range of uh, specific uh, codes, uh, guidelines, and other kinds of resources uh, made uh, available. And it's obviously been a very important uh, source of inspiration for uh, our uh, project. I believe that the tools that will be uh, co-created by the Soft for AI project and will be novel uh, in this uh, field, will be uh, an important supplement to the existing uh, catalog of resources in the Embassy of uh, Good Science. And we will make all of our uh, outputs available in the, through the Embassy of uh, Good, uh, Good Science. Uh, it's also uh, our intention, and this is uh, uh, something that we have been discussing with uh, the entire consortium, uh, that uh, our project will be uh, part of the pilot testing and will be featured and will be engaging with the upcoming community and in initiatives pages of the embassy that we learned about uh, uh, yesterday during uh, the first day of the uh, presentation. And obviously, we will pro be providing uh, links from the embassy of uh, good science and vice versa uh, when we come towards the end of, uh, of, um, uh, of our finalized uh, toolbox. Chris, you are emerging now. I think this is because my 10 minutes are up and it's uh, also the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nils, for this nice presentation. So we have made a movement from, on the one hand, principles in the ALIA codes. We have now seen that there is a lot of work being done on practice and the link with these principles. Thank you very much for this presentation, Nils. In, and I see that in the meantime, the questions are posted and if people want, you can react on it. If the question is for you, you can already start answering it.
but in the third uh, presentation, the third move, we will go back to the principles and the norms, because we will go back to a national code, uh, namely the Swiss Code of Conduct. It is, as far as I know, one of the most recent national codes. And uh, this new code and the new accents uh, in comparison with previous versions and maybe also with other codes will be presented by the chair of the Committee for Research Integrity. And it's our colleague, Edwin Charge Constable. Uh, you have the floor. Please turn on your mic and your, we see you already and share with us your presentation. Thank you. So thank my thanks to the entire team uh, for the opportunity to present our new code. Um, I hope that my screen is now sharing and I will move instantly from the first slide to the Perfect. second slide to allow those of you who are rapid with their uh, cell phones to capture the QR code. Um, we published our new code for scientific conduct um, in 2021, and it being Switzerland, we published in four languages, which um, certainly brought to our attention the nuances of language in the research integrity community. Um, the four versions are available online and are free to distribute. What I want to do in this brief uh, presentation is to tell you something about why about how and about what the future is holding for us. Why now is the question that we are always asked. And um, I think that more than anything else, the world pandemic has brought scientific integrity into the um, fore. We know that bad science damages the reputation of good science. And we worked from the assumption that good science is science that obeys the tenets of uh, research integrity. And I've just uh, taken uh, from the uh, Retraction Watch website, 150 papers have been retracted uh, recently on COVID. And these bad papers have a disproportionate impact upon the quality and the reputation of the good papers. Equally, quality of research is under pressure. And um, this pressure is coming from all directions onto the scientific community. And here I take note of the comments earlier, I use science in the Germanic sense for all knowledge creation and knowledge usage. Dear um, colleague, I think your presentation is still on the first page, is that correct? Uh, no, let me exit then and reshare. That usually achieves this. You should now see a slide dealing with pressure. Uh, under pressure, yes, thank you. And do you also see a COVID? Yes, please. yeah. Okay, fine. This is, my apologies. Uh, in that case, while I talk, I will leave the QR code there just in case anybody is very rapid with their handies. Because we are under pressure from our employers as academic institutions, under pressure from the general public who want to see value for money and relevance, under pressure from politics and the funding agencies. And all of these are pressures which can lead to transgressions of research integrity. So our starting point, of course, were the shoulders of the giants, to quote Isaac Newton, um, the Alia Code, our previous Swiss Code. And what we wanted to do was not just to revamp these, but to ask ourselves, what is new? What are the new challenges that need to be in a code of integrity? Um, and I hope my slides are advancing now. And we recognized that the principal challenges came from this new external and unregulated oversight of scientific activity, retraction, what to pub peer, new communication modalities where information is transmitted, uh, social media, technical capacity. You can, if you do classic FFP, you can do it better than ever with the tools that are available today. And we wondered whether compliance with the, reliant, with the requirements of funding agencies was also a um, aspect that should come into research integrity in the future. And we also address questions of how we avoid fake news, correct fake news, willful misinterpretation uh, or misrepresentation of facts. So we 
built an expert group uh, representing the stakeholders, um, Swiss universities, which is our Rector's Conference, uh, the National Science Foundation, which is our funding agency, um, InnoSwiss, which is an innovation um, platform between academia and industry, and the Academies of Arts and Sciences and all the components academies. Um, we tried to keep as broad a base as possible and also to ensure that uh, our recommendations were within the national and local legal framework. Uh, we had um, legal advice within the expert group. Uh, the code we hoped would express a common understanding of what constitutes scientific integrity. Maybe this community, that is not an issue, but in the at the front line of the experimental scientists, there is still a lack of clarity and a lack of understanding of what this is about. And what we wanted to do was to make this group, the active scientists, engage with the integrity and recognize that good science also conforms to the um, standards of research integrity. Uh, we wanted to say what type of behavior is unacceptable, what also standards should be used for any investigations, and in the background, open, fair, open data, open science, and so on. And this was a very, very um, integrated approach, regular uh, progress reports and exchange with the stakeholders. The principles um, in the Swiss system, the independence of the universities is holy. And so we had to make recommendations which would then be implemented within individual uh, universities. So we're not having a diktat from on high. We wanted to go beyond FFP. Um, the code was not meant to merely appeal to people, but it was meant to give a common understanding of what scientific integrity is. Um, we tried to identify what are the more flagrant violations of scientific integrity. And we really wanted the research community to embrace and recognize that equating integrity with best practice would not impact their research activities. The code comprises six chapters, a general introduction. And then we thought it was very important at the beginning to define who the code was for. We then briefly reiterated the principles and then how they should be implemented or could be implemented within a research environment. We then went on to identify what would be regarded as a violation of integrity. And then unfortunately, um, in cases where there are suspected um, transgressions, we made brief recommendations regarding best practice in investigation in particular for transparency and um, for coherence across the sector. Um, and I've just now pulled a few um, highlights out where I think we went a little bit beyond other codes. Um, we looked at different ways in which misconduct could be identified. Um, we looked at improper handling of data, publication lists. It's very common, for example, from funding agencies to recognize that publications lists don't always bear 100% um, overlap with reality in terms of author sequence or author um, uh, priority. Um, we also went a little bit Further, misconduct in research misconduct proceedings, lack of um, declaration of conflicts of interest, and also in connection with peer reports, peer reviews, and the general service to the academic community. And of course, other, which was everything else. Um, we also went one step further, which has um, brought us a, a lot of, um, not necessarily negative uh, comment, but certainly a lot of um, comment um, in that we have identified self-plagiarism as being on the same level of uh, transgression as plagiarism. So reusing substantial parts of one's own work or one's research proposals without giving appropriate credit we regard as being on a level with plagiarizing a third party's work. Um, and this is um, something which we believe is almost unrecognized within the scientific community, although it is, of course, recognized within the um, integrity community. 
we also attempted to give a generic uh, for investigation. Um, we strongly recommended separation of the various aspects, the pre-investigation, a real investigation, and then clarified the various decision-making steps. The reason for this is because of the diversity within the Swiss educational system and with the independence of the individual universities. We have within the university system alone some 17 or 18 different codes, each one with each individual university and each with a, a separate um, investigative uh, procedure. And we wanted to try to get at least some coherence across the sector. Um, I think this is a fairly standard document. It's a, a fairly regular flow chart, but the important thing is that these various red bodies, the advisory and arbitration body, the investigatory body, and the decision-making body should be separate and also separate from the uh, final body um, involved with making sanctions. Which brings me to my penultimate slide. Um, and I see that uh, Chris has appeared, so I'm perfectly on time. Um, we spent a long time talking about sanctions. The lawyers wanted to have a big capital chapter on uh, sanctions. We considered this was not appropriate, um, par partly because of the devolved nature of the system and partly because when we looked into the legal issues, um, because of the Swiss federal law and the individual cantonal uh, laws, we had some 34 different legislations to consider. Um, and that is a nightmare. I can guarantee. So let me come to my final slide. The important thing on this is thank you at the bottom. But the most important, I think, is that we are trying to generate the concept that a culture of integrity is also the best scientific practice. It's the research culture that we want to embrace. And that should be embraced by the community and should not be avoided by the community. Thank you for listening to me talking very quickly. Thank you, dear colleague, for your presentation and for your uh, nice message at the end, huh? kind of summary of your uh, global approach. We have now some 10 minutes for questions, and you have seen that in, in the uh, Q&A, we have quite a lot of questions already. Uh, I would like to start with a first question for the first speaker, uh, Dr. Varantola. Um, we have had some questions on the inclusion, the, 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 the accent, the new suggestions on inclusion, diversity, equality, and so on. And there is a double question with regard to this. Is this really part of the integrity discussion or not? And second question, should these aspects, inclusion, diversity, equality, be considered rather as an institutional or as an individual responsibility. Could you give some reflections on this? Thank you. Yeah, yes, I, th I think that the, uh, equality, inclusion, diversity are certainly part of the overall picture, but is that part of the code? That's another issue. And uh, we did discuss these issues last time and, and they cropped up at, at this revision or repress stage as well. Because I think personally, I mean, you, you can't achieve integrity at institutional level if you don't pay attention to these aspects aspects like um, like um, equality inclusion and so on but should we mention that in our code that we the <laughs> the jury is still out we don't know maybe we we'll, but what we've been thinking of is referring to uh, to different aspects because there there are lots of codes available or lots of statements available refer to them say that they are parallel issues but in order to keep our code focused on the researcher issues then we we have to be very careful so i don't have a definite answer but yes of course they're part of the the whole whole issue of the research system the whole issue of societies in general so but how what is the best solution that remains to be 
be seen. Um, and I have noted there, uh, we have noted this, this is that came up at, at our previous meeting. So, so is that a sort of good yeah. enough? <laughs> good enough. I, I, I'm very sure it will be good enough. Thank you so much for your reaction. And then I have a question for all the three speakers. Um, some people were saying some European professional or uh, uh, societies, uh, different disciplines, do not have their own codes, but they refer to the ALIA codes. And we also see that in some countries, they have no plans to up update their old code, but they refer to the ALIA code. So the, this double uh, tendency or uh, movement, you could say, uh, of referring to the ALIA code, which is a code of general principles. Is this something um, you're happy with or not? Uh, I will see that, for instance, in Switzerland, they were very happy to have their own updated codes. Other countries decide uh, differently. What's what this? Uh, what are your maybe a short reaction from the three speakers on have not developing new codes, but referring to a general set of principles of the ALIA code? Is this something you are happy with, or what would you recommend? May I ask the the second speaker, uh, Nils, to react first? Thank you very much. Well, I uh, I think that the more you disaggregate, disaggregate, the more that you funnel down needs and problems will uh, change and become uh, significantly more specific. Uh, uh, Professor Valentola took us from the broad European level where we need to speak in broad and fundamental principles. And Professor Constable took us to the country level where regulatory frameworks need to be taken into account, adjustments need to be made. And when you enter into the organizational level issues about disciplinary composition, uh, uh, organizational properties, uh, size, capabilities, etc., um, uh, composition of the task uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, the workforce uh, will create its own kind of uh, uh, needs and, uh, uh, and problems. And I think that, that uh, while there has to be consistency between the broad level principles, the national, uh, the, the national uh, governance arrangements and the local level uh, policies and uh, procedures, I think that we can talk about finer levels of, uh, of granularity uh, through these uh, three uh, levels. And I think that's entirely appropriate. So I would like to see efforts and uh, involvement uh, at uh, multiple levels of the organizational system, including different agencies, different actors, but also different uh, vertical levels. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Um, colleague uh, Constable, uh, I saw you nodding. Uh, could you have a short reaction? Yeah, I would agree exactly with uh, Niels that the granularity is important. Um, and maybe I would take it down one level even further, that one of the things we tried to avoid or rather we wanted a one document fits all, but with a recognition of the uniqueness of each of the disciplines. And so uh, we need to devolve down again to the disciplinary level to ensure that there is appropriate uh, fit for purpose, um, best practice within the disciplines. And that of course is not a national concern that goes back into the global and the um, European uh, arena. Um, and I think that uh, we, also um, recognized that there were going to be a kind of mosaic structure of different levels of granularity um, coming together in any uh, given case. Thank you. Uh, Professor Varantola, you have the last word. Thank you. Yes, I definitely agree with Niels and Edwin. That, that's the idea with the LAR code. It's, it's not the, the, the code that, that replaces other code. It's a good start in countries or, or institutions where there is no code. But I think at, at some countries, as we've seen in Europe, have the codes, uh, national codes 
have legal power somewhere like in Finland it's um, a question of self-regulation and, and a system of signatories and so on so that that to be decided at the national level or if there's no national level then at the institutional level and and I think everybody has to ask the question what does this mean for us how are we going to do this and um, the Alea uh, but in countries, I think it's a good starting po point in, in countries that have no codes at all. <laughs> to point out that you need a code and you need to apply it to your own circumstances. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the three speakers. Uh, we managed to really land in uh, due time. So.